One of NASA's biggest concerns about its moon program right now is that SpaceX's Starship development isn't progressing fast enough. The main reason is that the spacecraft still faces a major hurdle, achieving reliable orbital refueling. But what if Starship didn't need refueling at all? Interestingly, that possibility could be explored by revisiting a concept NASA once abandoned. Back when NASA was established in 1958, the agency began envisioning a launch vehicle that could go beyond Earth orbit, one that could carry astronauts all the way to the moon. That ambitious idea became known as NOVA. It was the centerpiece of NASA's very first long-term space exploration plan, which they presented to President Eisenhower on January 27, 1959. NOVA had one clear goal, to make a direct ascent to the moon. In other words, the spacecraft would launch from Earth, fly straight to the lunar surface, and land, all in one continuous trip. No assembling parts in Earth orbit, no docking with a separate lander waiting around the moon. Just one giant rocket doing it all. To pull this off, NOVA had to be an absolute monster of a rocket, bigger, taller, and more powerful than even the legendary Saturn V. Its massive diameter would have allowed more engines and a much heavier payload. The first stage was basically a supersized version of the Saturn V's SIC, loaded with eight F1 engines that pumped out an incredible 61,925 kilonewtons of thrust. The second stage followed the same idea, featuring eight J2 engines producing 8,265 kilonewtons. Finally, the third stage was a stretched version of the S-4B, used to complete the journey to the moon. In this setup, NOVA could have carried a mind-blowing 210,000 kilograms below Earth orbit, or 74,000 kilograms on a translunar trajectory. That's enough to send an entire moon base in one go. So, why didn't it happen? Well, the reason was surprisingly simple. NASA didn't have a big enough building to make it. The Michoud Assembly Facility's roof just wasn't tall enough to handle a 12-meter-wide rocket with eight F-1 engines. At best, they could manage a 10-meter design with four or five engines. So, they scaled down the plan and went with the Saturn V instead. And to be fair, Saturn V did exactly what NASA needed at the time. Send a few astronauts and a small payload to the moon to meet the political goal of the era. But imagine if they had built NOVA. NASA could have sent tons of equipment, rovers, habitats, basically everything needed for a permanent lunar outpost. Now, here's where it gets interesting. SpaceX's Starship actually shares a lot of DNA with NOVA. In terms of raw power, Starship even outperforms it. Its first stage, powered by 33 Raptor engines, generates up to 73.5 megajoules of thrust, easily surpassing NOVA's first stage. The second stage, with six Raptors, also beats NOVA's upper stage in sheer muscle. Sure, Starship's specific impulse is a bit lower, but its vacuum-optimized engines help close that gap. Its dry mass is a little higher than NOVA's upper stage, but not by much. So, here's a thought. What if we combine some of NOVA's design philosophy with modern Starship tech, a sort of NOVA-Starship hybrid? Maybe we could end up with a fully self-contained moon rocket that doesn't even need orbital refueling. I mean, how hard could it be, right? First off, SpaceX's Starship and Super Heavy combo is an incredible system. On paper, it's designed to lift around 100 tons into low Earth orbit in a fully reusable configuration, which is amazing. But if we want to push it to make a single trip to the moon without refueling, we'd have to go all in on an expendable setup. That means no reusing the upper stage for this mission. Strip off the heat shield, we won't need it. Lose the nose cone, we'll replace it with a payload fairing instead. Take off the fins, and of course, forget about saving fuel for a landing burn. The goal here is simple, go for maximum performance. The booster would only need to put Starship on a suborbital trajectory, letting the upper stage handle the rest to reach orbit. With all those optimizations, I think it's completely reasonable to expect something like 250 to 300 tons to a near orbital trajectory from a fully expendable Starship upper stage. Another thing to consider is that no 
Nova was a three-stage rocket, which made it much easier to reach the moon on its own. In fact, that's one big reason why the Saturn V back in the day didn't need refueling, while most modern rockets do. For lunar missions, the Saturn V used two heavy lift stages to handle the hardest part of the job. The first stage, the Saturn 1C, powered through the thickest part of the atmosphere, while the second stage, the Saturn II, carried the stack almost into orbit. Then came the much lighter third stage, the Saturn 4B, which finished the job. The Saturn 4B was still a large stage, but it was relatively lightweight compared to the rest of the rocket. It could be restarted and had enough fuel to both complete orbital insertion and then perform the translunar injection burn. To be fair, NASA experimented with other staging concepts too, like the 1.5-stage Mercury Atlas and the two-stage Titan II for Gemini and Saturn 1B for early Apollo missions. But those were purpose-built solutions for very specific missions. Mercury and Gemini only had to lift small payloads, and the Saturn 1B was mainly used to get the Apollo capsule into low Earth orbit for testing. They weren't evolutionary dead ends, just one-off designs to solve particular problems. Anyway, if Starship really wants to reach the moon in a single flight, adopting a three-stage configuration might be the way to go. Right now, it's compromising a lot of useful payload capacity by hauling so much dead weight all the way into orbit. So, what would happen if Starship had a third stage of its own, tucked inside that enormous payload bay? Surprisingly, that's actually quite feasible. Starship's fairing is so large that it could physically fit something about the size of ULA's Centaur 3 upper stage, the same one used as the second stage on the Vulcan rocket. However, while a Centaur would fit dimensionally, it wouldn't quite match the performance of Nova's third stage. The Centaur runs on hydrolox, liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen, and typically uses two RL-10 engines. Even if you doubled that to four RL-10s, you'd get about 96,000 pounds of thrust, roughly 430 kilonewtons in total. By comparison, Nova's third stage used a single J2 engine that produced around 232,000 pounds of thrust, or about 1,030 kilonewtons, more than twice the power with the same Hydrolox propellants. Even if this setup provided all the performance needed, there are still some major drawbacks. First, Centaur and Starship belong to two different companies, ULA and SpaceX, and direct collaboration between them is tricky without a third party like NASA acting as a mediator. Beyond the business hurdles, there are also technical issues. Fueling a Centaur while it's enclosed inside Starship's fairing would be extremely difficult. If it were fueled beforehand, hydrogen boil-off would quickly become a major concern, not to mention the safety risks of encapsulating a fueled cryogenic stage. That said, if a Starship Centaur concept ever did make sense, the most practical solution would probably be for SpaceX to design a custom Starship variant tailored to carry and operate a cryogenic upper stage, whether that's a Centaur-type module or something entirely new. Honestly, I think the best option would be to design a completely new low-cost, expendable third stage made specifically for Starship. There have already been a few ideas floating around about that. The main concept would be to take advantage of Starship's cost-effective construction methods, using the same stainless steel tanks and a single off-the-shelf Raptor engine. This third stage would use a standard sea-level Raptor, which has a vacuum efficiency of about 356 seconds of specific impulse. Because the height of the third stage is limited by Starship's payload bay, a vacuum Raptor with a large nozzle isn't ideal, even though it's a bit more efficient. It's actually more beneficial to make the propellant tanks slightly larger than to stretch the engine bell, since extra fuel adds more performance than a small gain in efficiency. The Raptor engine itself is quite powerful. In fact, it has more thrust than the stage really needs. Even if it could throttle down to 25% power, the end of burn acceleration would still be about 30% higher than what a Falcon 9 second stage experiences with its Merlin 1D engine. If that throttle range isn't possible, SpaceX could simply develop a modified version of the Raptor for smoother performance. The proposed third stage would carry about 93.9 metric tons of propellant, which seems to be the sweet spot for maximizing payload to a translunar trajectory without any refueling. Starship's full payload capacity to low Earth orbit is about 150 metric tons, so even with the third stage included, there would still be room for around 50 metric tons of payload. Because of the height constraints inside Starship's 9-meter-wide payload bay, the third stage would probably use short, domed, cylindrical tanks instead of more spherical ones. 
This would let it fit comfortably inside, with the stage standing about 8 meters tall, leaving roughly 11 meters of vertical space for the payload and adapter. Overall, a simple, expendable third stage, built from the same materials and engines as Starship, could be a cost-effective way to dramatically increase its reach. It wouldn't require complicated refueling or new technologies, just smart reuse of what SpaceX already builds well. Overall, a Nova-like three-stage Starship has its share of benefits and drawbacks. Adding a third stage would boost Starship's performance on high Delta V missions. And if it's designed for low-cost manufacturing, it could also reduce the cost of certain missions by eliminating the need for orbital refueling. For a moon program, not having to refuel could speed up the development of a Starship variant tailored for that mission, potentially keeping timelines on track and satisfying NASA. That said, a third stage wouldn't offer much economic benefit for launching satellites to Geostationary Transfer Orbit, GTO, or for most lunar missions. There might be some cost savings for Mars missions, and for direct-to-GEO or interplanetary missions beyond Mars or Venus, a third stage could save significant money. Since the third stage would essentially be a small starship without a heat shield, fairing, aerodynamic control surfaces, landing legs, or header tanks, development costs should be much lower than for the full starship slash super heavy system. High Delta V missions aren't very common right now, so it might take a while for development costs to pay off. However, starships low launch cost could eventually increase demand, though likely with a delay of several years. Government agencies like NASA and the U.S. Air Force are the main customers for missions requiring high Delta V, such as direct-to-geo or interplanetary missions, and they might be willing to help fund development. Some customers might also prefer a third stage because relying on multiple tanker flights and orbital refueling adds schedule and mission risk. In that sense, having a third stage available could make it easier for SpaceX to win certain contracts, even if the mission could technically be done without it. Direct-to-geo missions may become more common with Starship, as the rocket could provide direct geo insertions for even the largest modern satellites at a relatively modest extra cost. In that context, developing a third stage could see a reasonable return on investment within a practical time frame. I do believe that refueling in orbit will still be important in the long run. It allows Starship to remain reusable while also being capable of deep space missions. It just might take a little longer to fully implement.